satisfying watching that metal melt getting to pour it into a mold you know, this project this bell bronze project I've been working on for two years solid you know actually working on the project and uh, I spent I don't know how many years you know many many years wanting to do it and you know researching and kind of getting my thoughts together on it um, trying to just pick up as much knowledge as possible along the way but a couple of years ago you know when everything kind of slowed down I finally had an opportunity to make it happen so I started going for it and uh, you know, I went and put together these boxes and got me some sand found a thing to use as a model for a bell and you know, I poured off several of these and then as I developed the skills and the process I realized like oh my gosh I have to create a scientific study of the metal alloys and so to do that I basically need to make like 20 bells that are all exactly the same size and dimension in every way and the only difference across the board is the specific alloy and mixture of each bell and so with that being the goal I have to very carefully measure weigh out the metals to get the alloys you know the ratio of the alloys uh, correct and um, yeah there's there's kind of a lot to that it's like if I mess up the the weights or or the calculations or anything like that then um, you know that bronze will be a perfectly legitimate quality bronze it just won't be exactly the ratio that it needs to be for this set of bells to legitimately be considered a scientific study so that's what I'm doing with this um, trying to illustrate the differences in tone and vibration of a large variety of alloys roughly 20 of them uh, that I have written down so far um, and uh, later on you know towards the end of the video I do a comparison of several of these bells and uh, you get to kind of hear exactly how they differ from each other and yeah it's a it's a very very cool project um, you know this uh, approach for this video I'm kind of taking some inspiration from a few different of my favorite youtubers um, firstly taking some inspiration from Big Stack D and his metal melting ASMR channel it is quite entertaining you know I've been watching him for a few years and you know his his material is great it's no talking you know just lots of video and a good pace and some quirky little creativity and personality stuff here and there but mostly it's just the metal melting but you know, he's got a good style he's got the little kind of closed captions of his own making um, added to the to the picture so that you can tell you know what's going on and just watch the video on silent which is pretty nice but yeah I've really I've really enjoyed his channel and I've learned a, a few tips you know uh, the sort of YouTube hobbyist metal melting channels aren't actually where I go for a great deal of my research and study and learning when it comes to the metal casting process and and all of that mostly I actually watch videos uh, from like 
India and Pakistan and places like that, you know, where the dudes are working in flip-flops with no safety glasses or nothing, no gloves, you know, they just, they just don't do anything stupid, just don't screw up, you know. So I do a lot of my research and trying to learn technique by watching all kinds of things like real bell makers and, you know, old blacksmiths and and a lot of the YouTube hobbyists too, you know, I get little things like this pouring basin, you know, this pouring basin, I've seen plenty of people doing it, I kind of didn't mess around with it for a long time, and then I finally started doing it, I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, that is the way to go, it makes for a much smoother pour. See, when I talk about technique, trying the same thing over and over, expecting a different result, it's <coughs> it's an issue with casting that you spend, uh, you know, hours putting together molds. And then, you know, up to an hour melting all kinds of metals. And then the pour happens in a couple of minutes. And if you get anything wrong throughout that process, uh, there's a very high probability that the piece isn't going to come out very clean or as clean as you want it to be. And so there's just so many details to keep track of and little tricks um, for making it all work out and make it, making it all be worth the time and the effort because it's not a cheap hobby, you know? It's costly. It costs fuel to run the forge. It costs metals. It costs time. Uh, there's wear and tear on every piece of the process every time you do it. The sand wears out. It's expensive. You know, just on and on and on. There's there's a lot of little nickel and diamond going on in this process. and So you really do want to be trying to get as efficient as possible, as clean to work as possible, so that it you know isn't costing you more than it should. But anyway, I digress. Um, that's why I put the word secret in the title of this video, is I'm, I'm actually showing quite a lot of little secrets that I picked up along the way um, from all over the place and I'm trying to throw credit where credit is due you know as uh, we all should and so yeah Big Stack D was a big inspiration I really definitely appreciated his content made me feel like it wasn't gonna be that big of a deal after all for me to go ahead and hop into this hobby and so um, yeah I'm combining that inspiration with uh, a little bit of some of the style of another favorite channel of mine called Peter Draws. The guy puts up amazing time-lapse videos of him drawing. And then, you know, after he films the whole drawing video, then he goes back and just records him yarning and noodling and literally just spinning off into just, just whack-a-doodle concepts and nonsense and sense and just it's ridiculous but it's really really cool really entertaining um you know it's definitely a channel that i think everybody should check out watch a little bit of definitely get your creative juices flowing but uh yeah you know i'm rambling a little bit but if you don't like it you can just shut the volume off and read the little words like most people do with these casting videos anyway but uh oh yeah here we go you know putting the two halves together it's always tricky business you got to line it up just right you don't want to destroy an hour of work in five seconds but uh and a lot of this voiceover doesn't have a ton to do with the specific things happening on screen but i don't care that's what the pictures are for. I've got me a pretty good pile of metal stashed up now. This is just my little kind of ready-to-melt stash that's all just a bunch of different kinds kind of lumped into one crate so that it can sit right next to my furnace and just kind of pull out of it what I need. But I've got buckets and barrels of all kinds of metal stashed all throughout here and you know, big old piles of ingots, and it's ridiculous. But, it's 
it's a lot of fun, you know. Um, it's actually not the best idea to turn all of your scrap metal into ingots if you care about its value uh, dollar, dollar-wise, its dollar value. Because if you're trying to take it to scrapyards, they pay the lowest price for ingots. The best price copper you can get is for this bare, bright, shiny wire where they can tell what it is. They know what it is. It's not a mystery block, right? And if I have any criticism for the YouTube hobby metal melting community, it is uh, the issue with, you know, building these giant piles of ingots, shiny ingots, that are basically mystery metals, you know, sometimes they stamp them 999 pure gold just to be funny or some crap, or because it looks cool, sometimes, you know, they're using dirty crucibles to to make bars, yeah, there's just all kinds of little factors, there's a reason the scrapyards don't even want to buy that stuff, and if they do, they pay the lowest price, because you just don't know what's in there. So, you know, I mean, that's a, another way that I was able to learn from watching their channels was to be kind of going, oh, dang, I need to get a fresh crucible for every type of metal I want to do, and basically every alloy, and really keep them separated so that I don't have cross-contamination of impurities or, you know, different mixes, right? Just good, clean metal. So that's kind of the the whole thing I've been working at here is to keep the metals in the form that they're most valuable, but then if I do melt them, melt them, make sure they're they're pure and they're kept pure, and that I then stamp them with not just what they are in terms of like, oh, this is aluminum, but like, where did I get that aluminum? Was it wire? Was it cast aluminum? Was it extruded aluminum? You know, same with copper. Copper wire is the best, but copper pipes, you know, that's not considered to be as pure of a copper. So, you know, if I make a copper bar out of pipes, it's going to say pipe on it, right? If I make a copper bar out of wire, it's going to say wire on it. So, I'm kind of, I'm doing that for myself so that I know, you know, what exact type of metal I have, and um, that'll come in handy for if I ever try to sell it, if I ever try to, you know, mix an alloy and I really need specific things, specific purities or this or that, and it'll come in handy uh, when I die and I leave a giant freaking mountain of metal behind, and it's all ingots, but nobody knows what the hell it is. I'll have it actually stamped, and there will be some provenance to that. You know, some proof of that because of all of the kind of video documentation um, that'll, at that point, there'll be quite a bit, I assume, on the internet um, proving the way that I do it and the process that I use and the, you know, kind of the attention to detail and purity that I uh, have. So. We'll see how that goes, but I'm just trying to do the best I can, you know? Take inspiration from everybody else, stand on the shoulders of them giants, give them credit where it's due, and just try to do the best I can. Try to do the thing in my way, so. Yeah, I really didn't feel like talking too much about uh, the mold making, but here we go. Weights, you gotta have weights with these sand molds, man, and it's not just about putting them on the edges so that the box fits together tight, it's actually about putting them on the sand so that the two sand halves fit together tightly. That is the key. If you don't do that, the metal comes spewing out uh, unpredictably. I wouldn't say more often than not, but pretty freaking often, so. Yeah, here's my homemade furnace. Uh, only part I didn't build was that little gas line. Everything else I did. It's mostly made out of scrap metal, so that's pretty cool. Turned out to be pretty cheap. 
thing to make, but it's a propane burner. I'm actually just using a frosty tea burner for anybody that knows what those are. Um, but I'm gonna upgrade it to a waste oil burner and do refractory cement. Oh, yeah, the cardboard. That was a big stack D trick. Um, yeah, if you don't do that, the crucible sticks to the fire brick, and then when you pull it out, the brick's stuck to the bottom, and it's way heavier and annoying, and it can break the crucible, and it's just all around sketchy. So you want to have that cardboard in there so that there's a carbon layer between the brick and the crucible, and then you're good to go. So here we go. Get some fire going in this thing. Oh yeah, there it is. This thing roars. Gets very hot. But I gotta do that waste oil burner so I can get it even hotter. Because I want to do cast iron. And you gotta be able to get up over 2,000 degrees for that. This furnace pretty much tops out at around 2,000 degrees. As it is. But that's fine for pretty much everything besides iron. Well, and like, you know, crazy futuristic metals, titanium and shit like that, but I'm not even messing with that. Hard to see here, but the crystalline structure of copper is fascinating to study. It's really, really cool. Copper takes forever to melt, and then once it's melted, it tries to freeze to harden back up instantly it as soon as the temperature starts dropping it just starts going solid it it's pretty crazy it's it's a really kind of unique metal in that way i mean silver is very similar but nearest i can figure is it has to do with the conductivity factor you know the silver and copper like their conductivity is so high that they just it takes a lot of heat for them to finally break down. Unlike this pewter cup. I mean, look at this. It just poof. <laughs> Gone. And when you melt, you know, tin, it it stays liquid for a good minute. You know, in a nice little puddle before it starts going solid. So, it's just interesting how that is, you know. Every metal behaves differently. And... You know, you just kind of have to keep playing with them to get them figured out. And, uh, yeah, that reminds me, like, basically, all it takes to figure them out is to flick them and rub them and tap them. It's really all you got to do, you know, kind of getting to the point now where I can mostly tell what a metal is just by doing that, flicking it, tapping it, rubbing it, listening to the tone you know, and now after doing all these bells, I'm actually starting to get an ear for bells where like, you know, if I hear them in a video or something, like I can, I can kind of tell which type of bell metal, roughly speaking, I'm not saying exact percentages and stuff, but I can, I, I'm, I'm getting an ear for that. I really am. Like I'm honing in on what exactly the ingredients are for, you know, tweaking the tone and, you know, making it more somber or making it more bright and happy and, and yeah, there's just, there's a lot to it, but at the end of the day, it's just all about feel. You know, that's what I really love about it is I don't need to use a thermometer, you know, just get in there, burn some hair off, melt some shit, make it happen. But all with a vision in mind for how it's going to sound. You know, how that tone is going to come out. And so anyway, this particular bell out of the 20 bells, which I've probably cast 20, but I don't have 20. I've cut and melted up many of them because uh, they weren't quite right. But anyway, this one is the one that I've been working towards the whole time. Just, I wanted to make sure I filmed it, so I kept putting it off and not trying it just kept doing the different the different alloys that I wanted as well so this one is really exciting because pretty much came out exactly as expected and I think in the end you'll 
you'll get to see what I mean. But here we go. You notice there weren't too many impurities to skim off there. It's pretty dang clean. It's because it's pure copper and high quality tin. All right, this is the secret right here. Poof, you see that flame bursting up and all that dust in the air? That is sawdust. That, that right there is one of the big tricks to bronze casting that I don't see any of the YouTubers using. And uh, that's not a diss, that's just throwing it out there. They're like, hey, you know, this is a little trick that I picked up from, you know, watching videos that were in different languages and, you know, with subtitles and having to sit there and, and you know, listen and try to read along and not miss it and go back, take a screenshot, you know, just trying to find these little tidbits. Well, it turns out, and you can see this even if you just watch, like, European bell makers, but you got to introduce wood into the equation during the pour, um, and it has to do with, like, the carbon, but then it more specifically is, like, burning off the oxygen, and um, the oxygen in, in the mold is what tends to cause imperfections in the cast surface. And so when you throw in that sawdust in there or you stir it with a wooden stick, which is what the Europeans seem to do. I got the sawdust method from uh, this video out of a North Korean dude who does like old school, traditional hammered bronze bowls and kettles and stuff. And uh, works great. Hoo-wee. I am drunk. Uh, full disclaimer, do not try this at home. I am a mature, grown man, could make my own decisions. And uh, so that's the perspective from which I'm speaking. I don't encourage this particular behavior. But <clears throat> I find it really interesting because I sit here and I drink and I smoke and I make a mold and then I have to rearrange as you saw and I set up the furnace and uh, I have to measure out the metals and melt them, get all that rolling. So throughout all that, I have, I don't know, many cigarettes. I waste a lot of them as you can tell. It's no excuse. <laughs> um, and I drink some drinks and then by the time that shit's nice and roasty, toasty, damn near 2,000 degrees. I've had like a good three and three, maybe four in me, you know? So then when it comes time to pour, there's this feeling, and I've had this with a lot of other mediums, media, and it's where no matter what's coursing through your veins, you just zero in you hit your focus your aim you like activate all that prior programming that you've done to yourself for doing a thing and you just and you hammer it out right i'm not saying that's automatic i'm just saying it's something that i've found i can do i've heard of many other people doing it it's an interesting perspective on you know inebriation and what it may or may not do for you. I'm not saying I need it or that it's better or I'm better because of it. Not at all. I'm just saying that it, it makes the transition more pronounced between, you know, lackadaisical hanging out or whatever, just mind all over the place to laser focus, right? It accentuates that. So you don't need it to do it by any means and it's probably better if you don't but it's just interesting to test the limits the boundaries of what you can get away with you know but not like in a in a stupid unthinking fashion i mean like in a you zero in nobody around you can tell you've had anything because you're more straight than they are and they're totally freaking sober you know you're just going hard just flowing
full-blown flow state. I don't know. I do it either way. That's my point. Like, or that's what I'm saying. Is like, it doesn't doesn't matter if I've been drinking or not. Like, that's what I do. Is, you know, hone in, laser focus in. But anyways, <laughs> probably cut that down. <sighs> it's time to crack this mold open. You never know, you know, at this point, I've put like two, three hours into this project, more than normal because I'm filming. Um, so right here is where you find out if you screwed up, if that rim has any notches in it, you're done. You have to redo it. So it's not a guarantee that the piece is going to work out well, but... When you get that rim all cleaned off and it's solid, you know, you're probably in business. From there, it's just a matter of if there are any holes or flaws in the rest of the piece, but those are less likely or less common. I have had them, but they're less common than the notches down in the rim. So a good rim tends to mean a good bell. And this one is a really good bell oh man it's not perfect all the way around but that is one of the sweetest rims i have gotten yet the best bell pour i've had and i have done a lot of bell pours <sighs> i mean not a lot in terms of like people that actually make bells for a living or something but a lot uh, relative to a novice such as myself I have made a lot of these and this is by far the best formed one I've made yet and I can't believe it I'm so psyched you know how hard it is to get the successes of reality to match up with successes of filmmaking so fucking hard guys that's the whole trick getting those things to line up and it's a trick that eludes us all myself included at least some of the time or maybe most of the time but that's what we're chasing with this fine art filmmaking stage shit so here it is no flaws Everything on the outside came out just perfectly. Now, if there are some minor flaws on the inside, it's really not going to be that big a deal. Um, you know, if it's a big divot or a, a void or, or something like that, you know, a big bubble, it's kind of going to affect my scientific study, so I tend to redo those. But the little knobs of, like, extra metal... Those aren't bad at all. You can just sand those right off and no big deal. That's the cool thing. It's like extra metal is a pain to deal with, but not catastrophic. But not enough metal is catastrophic. <laughs> I use a brass brush on bronze because brass won't score, scratch, and ding the bronze. But a steel brush can actually wear brush marks into the piece so check them lego brick weights out <laughs> those are fun those are pure high quality electrical wire copper yeah might as well make those blocks big so i can use them for something else i'm all about function function over form even as a fine artist you know who's deeply into aesthetics and all of that it's at the end of the day the best aesthetic property is that the thing is fucking useful in the real world it's like it's like if it if it's not it's almost automatically dumb to me you know it's just it's just how i feel about it function is very important if something doesn't have a function that it almost doesn't even belong in my life you know so I appreciate colors and textures and 
you know, flow, all these things of beauty, right? I appreciate them deeply, but if there's no use for the item other than to look at, I get bored with it. I like interactive objects. I don't like stuff that you just look at. But pretty much all I own is tools, so <laughs> that's just me. Yeah, in a lot of my videos I don't show, you know, all of this detail, but like I said, I'm kind of doing one that'll fit into the realm of YouTube metal casting hobbyists. Yeah. So, this one's for that crowd. I leave the casting scale on these bells, at least in this series, for this study. Um, you know, not polishing it up is is part of the information that is being captured, right? Every every alloy looks different when it comes out of the mold. Every alloy has a different casting scale, as it's called, and it's it's all kinds of cool oxidation and and colors and swirls and textures, textures that once you polish them off, like, you can never get those back, you know, that rough sandy texture that you get even if the sand is nice and smooth, you still get a little of that roughness, you, you, you can, you're not getting that back if you sand it off, so for this set, it's important to be able to see that as well, it's not just the tone, you know, it's not just the sound and the color, it's also the just texture involved in any given alloy. And like I said, they're all different, and you'll see that towards the end here when I do some comparative images. But um, right now, it's just I've got to get a hole in that tab at the top to hang it, and also have to put a danger down inside it so that it will make beautiful sound. And like I said, I I had it in mind that this particular bell metal alloy would be brighter, happier, you know, really lovely high tone. Um and so it's mixed to be that way and the question is, will it be that way, given it's an alloy I have literally never made before doing this particular video? But it did work out, so I'm excited about that. Uh, drilling bronze sucks. It is softer than steel, but it kind of sucks to drill more than steel does. It just tends to bite the blade and, you know, stop the drill and start damaging your tools. I don't know. Maybe I'm doing it wrong, but it's just not easy. Something that has definitely helped is using these aluminum ingots for vice jaws. That is the best vice jaw I have seen yet <laughs> in terms of function. And aluminum's cheap, so... Heck with it. Got me a few scraps. I was pretty happy that the amount of metal that I mixed was the exact amount that I needed. But even so, there will be a little extra because these vents and sprues, and then of course that was in the bottom of the crucible. So I poured that off into a little mold, but, you know, pretty, pretty exact. It's just, you know, I got this big chunk in this big bar. So now I'm going to turn that into something else. It's not enough to make another bell, so if I want to make changes to the alloy, well, then this stuff just has to be made into something else, so... And i got to make a new batch for a new bell, so... Yeah, you start getting all kinds of little piles of different alloys and 
if you lose track of what they are, they pretty much just become scrap bronze, right? Which is great. It's still totally good, usable metal, you know? I know what went into it, so I know it's good metal. It's just I don't know exactly what it is anymore if I lose track of, you know, my little piles. So, you know, I put them in jars, obviously, but still... It, it's kind of cluttery, so I try to keep taking those scraps and turning them into other things. Ooh, so here we go. Time to fit the danger. This part is fun. Where do you think the best sounding spot is? I'm not sure that it actually ended up landing on the spot, the exact spot that I wanted it to, but whatever. These dangers are temporary. These are pure copper, made out of copper wire that I then basically candle dipped into molten copper and it stuck on and created the little knobs at the end. And they work great. It's just, it's not the finished uh, danger. I'll be actually casting some up that have a loop on the end for putting a rope. You know, that's really the way these need to be need to be done. So I'll get around to that probably after I make all the bells, <laughs> but for now, just throwing those quick and easy ones in there so that I have functional bells and don't just have a bunch of empty bells hanging in there because that's no fun, you know. The awesome thing about owning <laughs> a big pile of these bells is that I can just ding-dong them whenever I want to and they're, they're really lovely tones most of them some of them suck but it's like I knew they were gonna suck I made them because I knew they were gonna suck and I wanted them to be comparative in this study you know but most of them it, it's just it's very uplifting to go walking through the shop just clanging bells you know at some point I'm probably gonna put them on some kind of hardware and get them hung up in up higher in the shop so that I can just pull ropes and it'll just, you know, Quasimodo the shit out of these bells, just clang a dang. Just people will know when I'm going into my shop to work all across the neighborhood, everybody will be like, oh, there's Gregor at it again. <laughs> I still need to do a little bit of filing on that rim, but that's the case with all of them. It's just kind of, again, perhaps a little bit like a part of the study. I don't know. They're not supposed to be polished, but that there is a proper bell bronze bell. kept it because it actually looks really beautiful but it, it was flawed and that one really was a bummer when I popped the mold open because it took me several more tries so here is the pure aluminum you know probably a little magnesium in there too but that's just how aluminum is. Honestly, I think that sounds like shit. Again, I, like I said, I knew it would. Which means I knew this one also would. Because this is an aluminum bronze. About 11% aluminum. And the rest copper. I love the colors, the way they came out on this. It's just so great. But I had to do it again because that first one was flawed. 
This one, the colors aren't as great, but it's got different types of swirls and patterns, so I had to just keep them both. Yeah, and then this would be your like classic sword bronze, ancient bronze, 12.5% tin. Lovely tone. There's a, a little hint of like discord in there. I think maybe dissonance is a better word for it. This one. This one is the exact same alloy. Everything the same as the previous one. Because of that flaw, it makes a crazy weird distorted sound compared to the one that's just like it. And here is today's. Brilliant. So there it is, simple as that, right? Perhaps we uh, no longer need to speculate our way into insanity on the old internet and YouTubes about the ancient bell bronze and how it was so special that they took all the bells down and replaced it with something inferior and we have no idea what it was, right? No, it's possible there's elements, known elements, that have been known for a long time that are not public knowledge. That's definitely possible, but just let me tell you, I've studied a lot of science, I've studied a lot of history, and I see no reason to believe that there was any extra special other missing ingredient in the ancient bell bronze other than what I showed here. All right. Now, I think the differences uh, clearly show, you know, reasons for the choice of alloy, but my point is secret, secret. They're keeping it secret. They're keeping the secret knowledge secret. 
Secret's a relative term, right? What's secret to you and what's secret to me are two different things, okay? It's because the more I learn, the more secrets I've attained. Secrets, right? And uh, less things um, feel like they're kept secret from me. And I just want to put it out there that pretty much everything is just right there in front of you. All these secrets are hidden in plain fucking sight. All right? They're just staring you in the face, waiting for you to fucking notice. And then as soon as you notice, it's like it's everywhere, right? But before that, it was nowhere. It was a secret that they, the mysterious they, were keeping from me. Right? Fuck that stupid shit. Like, I, I get it, but it's like, it's there, man. Nobody on the internet told me that that was the secret to Bell Bronze, right? I figured it out from contemplating the idea, flicking different metals, listening to the tones, paying attention to the vibes, right? And then it became obvious. It's like, oh yeah, that's the secret ingredient. Once I realized that, then I started seeing that on the internet, right? I started finding it in videos, just little tidbits about it. Anyway, point just being, secret is a relative concept, right? This video is full of secrets. To me, none of them are secrets because I've explored them, right? To other people, none of the things that I've said in this video are a secret because they've explored them. Okay, so, Tartaria, right? There's been a lot of uh, kind of soiling of the concept, right? A lot of things have been binned into that category and now a bunch of sycophants and fuck faces who just want views and clicks and freaking popularity have tarnished it. And so those of us who have been into this you know, lost history or hidden history or misunderstood history, whatever you want to call it, rabbit hole for a very long time, you know, decades and people who are dead now, right? We're standing on the shoulders of those giants. Like, we're all getting fucked over by these stupid fucks going out there and yarning all this stupid speculation about fucking Tartaria and all history is a lie and it's all bullshit. Oh, my God, dude, these people clearly spend way too much fucking time in front of a computer and not enough time living their fucking lives and actually traversing and experiencing and exploring the real fucking world. Okay, that's my rant for today. I'm just sick and fucking tired of the term. I'm sick and tired of that bin. I'm tired of that crowd and what they're saying about it because it's so much fucking horseshit, right? They're spinning yarns about a bunch of stuff that me and a bunch of other people who know more than me can actually explain in clear, tangible terms. But you know what? That doesn't get clicks. What gets clicks is sensationalizing shit. So, that's that.